Okay. Uh, so mm, welcome everybody to the ICTP Serve Safe IFT UNES Physics Discussion Colloquium. Uh, welcome, Professor Leticia. It's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, usually, uh, questions are allowed at the end of the seminar, unless otherwise requested by the speaker. If one, if you're watching on YouTube. Please type your question on the chat, and I will lead, read it on, at the end of the talk. Uh, today, we're we're very happy to receive Professor Leticia Culiondolo. She is an Argentinian condensed matter physicist. She has a PhD at the National University de la Plata. Today, she is a full professor at Sorbonne University in French. And she is a, sen a senior member of the Institut Universitaire de France. Professor Culiandolo uh, has won uh, some scientific awards. In 2002, she won the Paul Lagenbaum Prize and Marie Curie Award of the Euro Euro European Com Commission. In 2015, she won the Irene Julio Curie Prize for the Female Scientist of the Year. So Professor Colliondo is known for her, her research in non-equilibrium thermodynamics, spin glass, and classic system. Today, uh, the talk is about this thermodynamics concepts out of the equilibrium. So welcome, Professor Leticia. You can start wherever you want. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, so. Yeah, the title of my talk is Thermodynamic Concepts Out of Equilibrium, from Classical to Quantum. But as you will see, uh, a large part of my presentation will be about uh, three uh, branches of uh, statistical physics, uh, which are nowadays attracting a lot of attention from different uh, researchers. And there are big groups uh, of people working on, on these fields because they open a lot of questions and um, they are also very challenging from a technical point of view, both experimental and um, theoretical. And uh, this is why so many people are, are interested in these fields. Um, my idea will be to give you introductions, very brief, of course, to these uh, branches of physics and then tell you, you know, one idea that somehow applies to all of them and uh, how it will perhaps be useful to try to understand out of equilibrium physics uh, from a kind of thermodynamic point of view. So what is the advantage of uh, dealing with the statistical physics in general? Well, the advantage is that you don't have to solve the dynamic equations, say in a classical setting, you don't need to solve Newton's dynamics for all the constituents of your system and uh, try to get you know, the full, time evolution of uh, your uh, ensemble of particles, let's say, or spins or whatever the constituents are, uh, which is certainly a very difficult task and, and very difficult to achieve. So statistical physics starts from the so-called ergodic hypothesis that tells that after some equilibration time, that is typically very difficult to compute as well, but let's assume it exists, T ek, Macroscopic observables of your large system, we are always thinking in terms of what is called the thermodynamic limit, so infinite volume, infinite number of particles, and so on and so forth. So macroscopic observables can be, on average, obtained with a calculation that does not involve time, a static calculation, and they are calculable as uh, an average of the observable in question, let me call it A, over all the possible configurations in phase space of your system. I'm thinking in terms of particles with positions and momenta, positions xi and momenta pi. Um, so we are making an integral over all the possible configurations of positions and momenta of the observable that you want to understand times a distribution, a probability distribution function that you have to define or propose. The functional form of this distribution, you have to propose it. But there are recipes for doing it, as I will show you in the next slide. And the hypothesis states that this static average should coincide with the temporal average that you would compute, making an integral over time, over a sufficiently long time window of the observable 
evaluated at all the times uh, along this trajectory, this interval, going from this equilibration time to another time, equilibration time plus two, uh, normalized by two, and in the limit of very long times. So the time average is what is typically measured experimentally, but it's very difficult to compute analytically. Instead, the statistical average is something that is typically not computed or not measured uh, experimentally, but it's easier to calculate, uh, you know, with uh, pen and uh, paper and a computer. <laughs> so, which are the recipes uh, for uh, this probability distribution p? Depending on the circumstances, uh, this p takes different forms. So, if the system you're interested in is completely isolated from the rest of the world, then uh, the microcanonical distribution states that p is proportional to a delta function of the Hamiltonian of your problem minus the energy that you give it initially. So this telegraphic e is the energy that uh, you give by choosing the initial conditions uh, to your evolution. H is the Hamiltonian evaluated uh, on the phase space variables of your problem, and you impose that h should be equal to e via this delta function. So it's a flat probability distribution that tells you that all the configurations on the available phase space constrained by this constant energy um, condition are equi equiprobable. From it, uh, sorry, from, oops, yes, uh, from um, this um, formalism, you can compute an entropy, you can compute a temperature as well. Now, there is another situation which is more common in real life, which is the one in which your system is not isolated from the rest of the world, is in contact with an environment. And by doing a simple calculation from microcanonical distribution, extracting the piece that interests you and integrating away all the rest which corresponds to the environment, uh, you derive the canonical Boltzmann form for P, which is this exponential of minus beta inverse temperature times the Hamiltonian of the problem. So this is just, uh, you know, um, to recall basic statements about statistical physics that tells you how uh, to um, propose, which form to propose uh, to this form, this probability P in different situations. So statistical physics has been, of course, very successful. There are many accomplishments uh, of this uh, formalism, uh, in particular that it gives a microscopic definition for quantities that were a little bit mysterious beforehand, like temperature, pressure, etc. And it also gives uh, equations of states, uh, so proofs of the equations of states, like the perfect gas uh, relation that I wrote on the on the right here. Uh, it also goes beyond just the description of uh, gases with no interactions, but it allows you to understand behavior of macroscopic systems with non-trivial interactions between the constituents, understand the um, existence of phase transitions, so macroscopic uh, sharp change, sorry, sharp changes that microscopic systems undergo when you change some control parameter, like, for example, the temperature of the environment with which you put your system in contact, or some external field, or pressure, or, you know, some other control parameter. So people have been able to classify and understand the behavior of macroscopic systems and collect uh, those behaviors in the forms of phase diagrams, like the one that I'm, I'm sketching here in this slide. So the calculations can be very difficult to uh, do with a pen and paper, but you know the formalism is clear, the theoretical frame is accepted, and uh, this is what happens with systems which satisfy this erotic hypothesis for which there is an equilibration time after which one can use normal equilibrium statistical physics. Statistical physics goes beyond classical problems. So there is even a classical quantum correspondence that can be established at the level of the uh, partition function uh, in the canonical ensemble, for instance. So uh, there is an equivalence between the um, d-dimensional quantum problem and a d plus one dimensional classical problem that can be, can be established uh, formally. And uh, this goes back to work by Feynman um, in, in the 50s, 60s, um, people in condensed matter like Trotter, Suzuki, Matsubara, and so on and so forth. So then uh, with the 
formalism that was developed for the classical problems. You can translate it to the quantum one and obtain quantum phase transitions, quantum phase diagrams, uh, develop quantum Monte methods, for instance, and so on and so forth. So statistical physics uh, has a lot of important players. Uh, some of them, uh, four of them that I've chosen here, are Landau, Anderson, Wilson, and Fowles. And I chose them because they have been involved in the development of phase transitions in the case of, uh, in the understanding of phase transitions. In the case of Landau, for instance, Anderson for glassiness. I will talk a little bit about glassiness later on. Wilson about universality and the RG, of course. And Fowles about topology and um, also the effects of uh, randomness and disorder on uh, the behavior of macroscopic systems. Um, this more is different is an expression, uh, which is the title of an article written by Anderson, uh, which was very, very influential and that uh, stresses the fact that when you have a lot of constituents in interaction, things which are unexpected can happen. Uh, like, for example, phase transitions that at the beginning of the century were not accepted as being possible. And then, okay, we have understood much better what was going on. Uh, but these are collective phenomena that uh, one would not be able to, to guess so easily uh, from just the expression of the Hamiltonian, let's say. And however, they, they, they happen, they, they arise in macroscopic systems. So um, this is something that is usually cited as uh, you know uh, something inherent to condensed matter physics and statistical physics and so on the fact that more is different from single so what happens when you go beyond equilibrium so how can you go beyond equilibrium or how can you be outside of equilibrium so i give you here three possible reasons for not reaching equilibrium one is that for certain systems, and I will give you some simple examples and not so simple examples later on, the equilibration time that the system would need to reach a situation where, in which the ergodic hypothesis applies can increase with the system size. And actually, in the limit of an infinite size system, which is the one you're interested in, diverge so quickly that it would go beyond any possible experimentally reachable time. So um, these are examples for, uh, these are cases which arise in critical dynamics. I will give you an example, coarsening, glassy physics, there are other ones. There are other cases in which uh, the situation is different. So you have a system which is in contact with an environment and this environment is injecting energy into the system. The system is releasing part of the energy into the environment, but then there are currents, so there are things going on within the system itself that make, him, make it stay uh, far away from equilibrium. And active matter, which is an example in biophysics, uh, belongs to this class. And then there are other cases which are very fashionable since like 15 years ago, more or less, which are the case of problems which are integrable. And uh, well, at the beginning, this could have been a little bit um, abstract as models and, and just models. But nowadays, there are experimental systems that are uh, known to be either integral or very, very close to integrable. And hence, uh, the, the existence of a number of conserved quantities, which scale with the number of variables in the system itself, um, make the approach to the normal Gibbs-Boltzmann equilibrium impossible. And um, so then people have tried to propose different measures, different piece, uh, like the ones I introduced at the beginning, uh, that go beyond the macrocanonical and the usual canonical and try to do statistical physics with the new distributions. And I will give you some examples of this. So let me give examples of the first situation when the equilibration time is so long that you cannot reach it in an experiment. So the simplest possible example is the case of phase separation. So imagine that you have oil and water. So oil and water want to separate. They don't want to be together. So you start from an initial condition where oil and water are very mixed. So it's an homogeneous configuration and you let it evolve under conditions such that low temperatures such that they want to separate. But they will not do it immediately. Actually, what happens is that there is this phase separation uh, process whereby domains of 
water on one side and oil on the other side start growing in time. So typically you would see in these problems, configurations that look like the ones that I'm showing you here with four snapshots taken at different four times after the initial um, evolution from the mixed configuration. So the red and the white regions in real space are trying to grow, but they are doing it with some speed. And they cannot, if this speed is not sufficiently fast, they cannot reach a situation which you have red on one side and white on the other side within reachable, reachable times in your experiment. Basically, these problems, what you can understand from them and even calculate under certain assumptions analytically, is the typical length of these ordered regions in real space where the sample is either red or white. And typically for these problems, this typical length grows as a power of time. So if you want this length to be of the order of the system size, which I'm calling here L, the linear size of the system size, well, you need a time that necessarily grows with L as a power of L. And okay, if you take L to infinity, this time goes to infinity together with L. So it will not be possible to reach this equilibration time if your system size is sufficiently large in your experiment. So basically what's going on is that the equilibration time diverges with the system size in this problem and many similar ones. Uh, now, is this just a crazy situation where you cannot say anything about this or just simply try to solve each of these problems one by one and find this growing length one by one? Well, no, actually what has been observed and, and even proven analytically in certain cases, experimentally, numerically, is that they are dynamic universality classes. So they are big groups of systems which behave in the same way with the same R of T growing with T with the same power. And what does this power depend on? Well, typically it depends on the kind of other parameter that characterizes your system, whether there are symmetries in your system, which is the kind of microscopic dynamics that you have, but characterized with simple terms. I mean, not just all the details, but you know, global properties of these microscopic dynamics. So there's, like in the equilibrium situation for criticality, you have universality classes here for out of equilibrium macroscopic phenomena like this one, you also have dynamic universality classes. And hence it's more interesting because you know it's not just a particular case that you will have to solve in some very special way to say something about a particular example. You will have you know, universality. So universality means generality and generality means interesting things to do. Now, I mentioned in the uh, beginning of this talk, uh, the, the issues about topology. So the problem I showed you before, if I wanted to be a little bit more technical, has uh, all the parameter, which is a scalar, is density, basically. Difference density between the water and the oil. Now, there are other problems in the same class uh, for which the other parameter is not a scalar, it's a vector. And problems with vector or the parameters are especially interesting when the vector has two components and when you are in two dimensions. So if you are within this situation, uh, which for example is given by this Hamiltonian that I write on the left, which uh, represents a magnetic system, but there are also problems in atomic physics, which uh, in the end are represented by this same kind of uh, um, formalisms. Um, those problems have topological defects, they have vortices. So vortices means that these vectors turn around some points and they are actually not well defined when you go to the coarse grained limit in which you have a field that represents what's going on. These fields, phi, which have two components, have a singularity somewhere. And these singularities are these vortices. And uh, these problems also have phase transitions mm, between a high temperature phase and a low temperature phase, let's say, where well, these vortices behave very differently. And uh, the understanding of what's going on at this phase transition and what's going on with these vortices is the content of uh, the work of Costa Lisanthales that gave them the, the Nobel Prize uh, a couple of years ago. And this kind of uh, Hamiltonian on the left or field theory on the right, which could 
seem very uh, abstract again and you know not um, very um, applicable to real systems as i said uh, there are loads of uh, experimental situations in, in quantum and in classical that have to do with this field theory here and if you want to estimate which is the equilibration time for this problem that for example you take from high temperatures of loads of uh, many 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 vortices and you cool it to low temperatures and you want to know what happens with these vortices that have to disappear somehow. The equilibration time for the disappearance of these vortices also grows with system size uh, in a way which is also a power with a logarithmic correction. Okay, it's not so important the logarithmic correction, but it's another kind of system for which the equilibration time diverges with system size and for which you cannot do statistical physics in equilibrium uh, below a critical temperature. Now, there are other problems which are much more complex than the two that I gave you, which can get an understanding from, um, uh, from a real space vision of what's going on with the field, with the particles, if we have particles, and so on, is the case, the case of glassy systems. So in glassy systems, uh, one doesn't understand what the particles are doing. So there is no real space uh, description of what's going on. Uh, there are measurements that give you very different things from the uh, ones, um, from the measurements I could do in the previous examples I gave you. Uh, but the best um, possible uh, understanding of what's, uh, or say, not understanding, but um, uh, um, description of what these uh, systems, why the systems are so complicated, is if you try to do something like the Ginsburg-Landau um, free energy description of, uh, you know, these problems here. So for the ones below, before you would have just one other parameter, a scalar or a vector with two components. Here, you cannot do with only one field or a field uh, which is a vector. You have to do with as many other parameters as degrees of freedoms you have in the problem. So if you have, say, uh, working with a, a spin problem and you have n spins, well, you have to have n other parameters to describe the behavior of the system. And if you want to draw a free energy landscape on these other parameters, like you do with the Ginsburg lambda with the double well uh, potential that everybody draws, well, here you have a what is usually called a rugged free energy landscape with lots of minima, lots of maxima, lots of plateaus, flat directions, very complex, complex structure. So uh, this can be computed for a certain number of models, uh, which are simplified models, uh, but still, so this can be characterized uh, analytically. There's lots of uh, theoretical physicists and probabilists who work on the topography of these free energy landscapes. Um, they also have an importance in applications in optimization problems. So uh, what is an optimization problem? Well, you have a difficult problem, mathematical problem for which you want to minimize some cost function. So you define some function that has the meaning of a cost and you want to make it minimal. So in this, Drawing here, this corresponds to finding the absolute minimum of this landscape. So the well, which is the deepest one in this very rugged mountain rich um, landscape. So how do you do it? I mean, it's very difficult. If you start from some point and then you want to roll down, you know, towards the minimum, well, first of all, you have to find the best direction to do it. And there are n directions and n goes to infinity. So, you know, this is a very complicated problem. This is at the heart of the optimization problems in um, computer science. And finding the minimum quickly corresponds to finding smart algorithms that take you to the minimum of these rugged landscapes. So it's a problem in applied math, computer science, that is very much linked to the problem of glassiness in physics. And this is why there are so many people, you know, working on both fields at the time, and there are so many changes between theoretical physics and uh, computer science uh, nowadays. Now, what have you learned from the study of uh, actual glassy problems, the ones that you can measure or study in the lab with experiments? 
So the things that we have learned is that these problems don't reach a stationary regime. So their evolution continues to go on and on in time in such a way that if you compute correlation functions between the configurations at two different times, these correlation functions don't depend on the difference between the two times, but still depend on the two times simultaneously all along their history. So this has to do with the loss of a stationarity and a property that is called aging in the field of uh, glassy physics. So there is a slow relaxation because all these correlations decay in time very, very slowly. And on top of that, they depend on when you start your measurements and also on the time that goes on after the initial instant at which you start your measurement. So here I'm showing, uh, you don't have to understand all the details of these plots, but these are a measurement of correlation functions over time. The different curves have been started the measurements at different times after the initiation of the experiment. And on the other plot, there is a measurement of a response function. So you have done something to the sample at these different T primes, and you measure how the sample responds after this perturbation that you have applied. So it's a measurement of a response function. So on the left, there is a decorrelation without external perturbation. On the right, there is the relaxation after an external perturbation, which has been applied to the system. In equilibrium, these two measurements are related in a system independent, model independent way. Out of equilibrium, they are not. And this is what I will show you later on. Now, as I have already said, uh, these problems these are measurements in spin glasses, but there are also measurements in other kinds of glassy systems, don't have an ident identifiable origin. We doesn't really know what's going on in real space with the configurations of the spins or with the configuration of the particles in the, can in the case of uh, you know, window glasses and so on. So the microscopic mechanisms are unknown, but still one can do macroscopic measurements like these ones and try to see if one understands something about why these things decay in this slow manner and you know how are these two related out of equilibrium i will say more about this later so this is the end of uh, the first class of ways of being out of equilibrium which is equilibration times which go too long and cannot be reached in the experiment now what about systems with energy injection and the active matter case so Atimata is a, a big name, which is given to uh, systems which are natural and which are artificial. So in these plots here, you have uh, ensembles of birds which are flying and making these nice uh, geometrical uh, figures here on the left. Uh, then there are uh, a picture of uh, what I call Janus particles. So these are particles which are coated with some chemical on one side and not on the other one. And they react with the bath in which they are immersed uh, only on one side. So the chemical reaction on one side of the sphere makes it move in one direction. So there is a chemical reaction that pushes, it's like a motor. So it's pushing it in one direction uh, as the birds are pushing in one direction because they are flying, right? So this is the similarity. Of course, the scales are very different. The origin of the motion is very different, but still, I mean, they have a preferred direction of motion that they can change, of course, because of interactions between the birds or because of interaction between the Janus particles, but they don't just move in straight lines, but they have a preferred direction still. And the other example is an example of granular particles. Okay, we'll jump over this. So there are also cellular examples. There are bacteria that move in this similar way. Uh, grains is the other. There are different scales of the microscopic objects that constitute the macroscopic ensemble, different reasons for uh, the energy injection that they get from the environment, because the birds eat and the uh, Janus particles eat as well in this chemical way. Um, these cells uh, have uh, reactions with the environment as well. So there is this energy injection, there is dissipation because they also give back some part of this energy to the environment, but they also use part of it to move in preferred directions and they interact between them. So the typical model that everybody uses if one wants to, to uh, 
uh, do some kind of a calculation with the computer or with the pen and paper on these problems is what is called the active Brownian particle model. Basically, this is just a system of Langevin equations. Uh, you have the effect of the environment, uh, thermal fluctuations with the noise, friction on the left hand side of this equation. Then you have the propulsion. So this is what forces the particle to move in one direction because of the chemical reaction with the environment. And you have the interparticle interactions between the particles, which is typically taken to be repulsive because this is the realistic thing. I mean, the birds don't want to go together. They want to separate a little bit at least, not to collision. And they're the same for the Chinese particles and the same for the other ones as well. So there are repulsive interactions. There's this propulsive force that takes it in one direction, but then there is noise that acts in the translational motion, but also in the rotational motion. So this second equation here uh, has to do with this rotational noise that makes you know the particles just not go straight, they turn a little bit as well, randomly. Mm -hmm. So in two dimensions, which is the simplest thing you can do uh, to study these problems, you have two control parameters, the packing fraction, basically how many of these particles you put in your box, and a number which measures how much energy you're injecting from the environment compared to the one that you can dissipate towards the environment. So this is uh, this Peclé number, this is the name it takes, but it's basically this um, ratio between typical energies. So what a single of these particles will do is random motion, uh, kind of a random walk, Brownian motion, sorry. And depending on how strong this injection of energy is, uh, the um, motion will be very, very random like here, or it will have these long periods of directed motion uh, in a preferred direction, which is the one along which this force of the motor is acting uh, until the thermal noise on the uh, angle makes it rotate. So it's like a persistent random motion. This is the way it's called. Now, for this problem, you can study it numerically, for example. You put it in the computer. You put all these Langevin equations in the computer for many particles in a box, and you see which are the phases that arise. Depending on these two control parameters, one is the activity, the other one is the packing fraction, how many particles you put in your box. And you see that, okay, there's a nice picture here with lots of faces. I don't want to discuss all these faces, but there are many faces, uh, similar to a solid phase when you have a lot of particles, high density, similar to a liquid or a gas when you have few particles, low density. You also have a very mysterious phase on the right, which is appearing at very high activity. You put a lot of energy from these motors. And what will happen is that the system will phase separate in two pieces. So um, I will jump over this because it's a bit late. So what basically will happen is that if I turn around this phase diagram and I put the activity in the play number in the vertical direction and the packing fraction in the horizontal direction, it becomes very similar to the phase diagram for safe phase separation that I showed you before. Uh, when I was talking about these coarsening systems that wanted to separate into water and oil, right? Uh, so in this other case, it was temperature in the vertical axis. Now it's Peclé in the vertical axis. But the horizontal axis is also concentration, is how many particles you put. And although the interaction between these active Brownian particles is repulsive, so they would like to go far apart from each other, because of the activity, they phase separate into a dense droplet, which I'm showing you here with different colors. So this is a region where they are all packed together, these particles, and an environment around it, which is very little dense. I mean, it's not dense at all, it's dilute. So this is like a gas, and this is like a dense uh, region in, uh, in real space. And this droplet moves, of course. This is just an instantaneous picture of it. And there are bubbles of gas within. And uh, OK, the different colors I will not discuss here. 
so why is it so? How could it be that these particles, because of the interactions between them, they want to go far apart, but still they are all together. Well, basically what's going on is that the particles which are at the boundary, they all have this preferred direction that, uh, you know, along the, which the forces are acting, pointing towards the center of this droplet. So the particles at the boundary, they cannot move away because they are pointing and trying to get inside the droplet. The other ones are pushing, but, you know, the push is not sufficiently strong to break this droplet. So here you have a phase separated system uh, due to this out of equilibrium nature, which is the energy injection that the motors are giving to the particles. But now you can say, well, okay, I have this very different situation from the one I had before for the uh, water and, and liquid, water and oil, sorry. Is the dynamics of formation of this dense droplet controlled by the same law that controlled the other problem? So I didn't tell you, but in the other problem, the Z, the power Z in the growth law of R is equal to three. And then you can ask, is the same one third controlling the growth of this dense droplet here, although the mechanism is completely different? So there you ask questions about universality. Is there universality going across these different out of equilibrium systems or not? Okay, one can say a lot of things about this. I will not, I will go on and give you the last example, which is the example of integrable systems. So, um, so the motivation for looking at these systems came from experiments, actually. Recent experiments, like 15 years ago, um, people in atomic physics managed to do the experiment, which is sketched on the left. So what they did is basically they prepared a cloud of uh, atoms and uh, they put them in a trap in one dimension. So uh, there is uh, like a confining potential that doesn't want to let these um, atoms fly away. And they started from these atoms, sorry, uh, located say at the minimum of this trap and they separated the cloud in two and they let half go to the right, half go to the left. And they let it evolve like this. And what happened? This cloud opened up, closed again, opened up, closed again, right? for very long, many oscillations of this kind. So there was no dissipation. I mean, there was no, they were not losing atoms and they were not destroying this initial condition. And, you know, they were going back recursively to the initial state that they, they built. So this, uh, is well, what is called a quantum Newton's cradle uh, called atom experiment. Um, so they prove they prove that uh, they could keep isolation from the environment for long, and they also could uh, see that there were quantities that were conserved. So this system was behaving like uh, an integrable problem. Besides, analytically, uh, Calabrese and Cardi solved uh, a certain number of models with conformal field theory methods and showed, proved, that uh, this is possible, you know, that in certain models you can conserve an infinite number of constants of motion, charges, if you wish, in the quantum jargon uh, that exist. And people said, okay, you have these systems with so many constants of motion, it's sure that you will not be able to describe the stationary limit of this problem with a Gibbs-Boltzmann kind of measure. Can you construct another measure? And uh, Riegel and collaborators, uh, in like 15 years ago, roughly, proposed to extend the Gibbs ensembles to what are now called generalized Gibbs ensembles, which are this is not moving. Ah, yeah. So, which are basically given by density operators now in quantum. So I have hats. So density operators uh, written here below, which involve in the exponential all the charges that you have in the problem. So if you have n degrees of freedom, you have n charges with gamma mu's, which are Lagrange multipliers, which are there um, playing the role of beta in the case in which you only have energy as a charge in your problem, as a 
operator that will give rise to conservation of energy. Here we have N operators, which are called IMU, uh, which give rise to the conservation of N quantities. So these alternative generalized Gibbs ensembles were proposed, as I said, to uh, describe these experiments. And they have been tested in, in a certain number of uh, situations um, that basically go analytically in the same in the in the following way. So the idea is that you take an isolated quantum system, which is characterized by a given Hamiltonian. You initialize your system in, for example, the ground state of that Hamiltonian. Then you change a parameter in your Hamiltonian instantaneously. So this is what is called a quench. And then you let your system evolve with a different Hamiltonian, which is the one that corresponds to this parameter having been changed. So the unitary time evolution is given by this operator U with the new Hamiltonian. And the new Hamiltonian is different from the original one. And then you ask questions like, does the system reach locally a steady state? If yes, are the expected values of local observables determined by Gibbs Boltzmann? No, for sure. But then you can say, well, are they described by this row GGE down here? Let's see. So doing calculations in many systems uh, which are solvable typically in 1D, uh, 1D problems, they have proven that indeed these integrable problems reach stationary states, which are describable by this kind of new um, density operators. So I have uh, introduced these uh, three subjects. Uh, there are, as I said, many, many people working on each of them. Uh, some people are also jumping from one to the other ones and uh, looking for similarities and differences between them. In principle, they look very different. So in principle, why should they have something in common? But OK, you know, thermodynamics and statistical physics of equilibrium applies to very, very different problems, which in principle have nothing to do one with the other ones. So is there something in common for these out of equilibrium systems as well? And in the remaining minutes I have, I will tell you about one thermodynamic notion, which is the extension of the idea of temperature that uh, applies to this three problems in different ways. I don't have time to discuss, I see uh, the way in which it applies to all of them, but I will just give you an idea of how it appeared as an idea. Actually, it appeared in the context of spin glasses and how it appears and applies, uh, at least to the active matter problem. I will probably skip the quantum one because it would take me a little bit long to, to do it. So this is a slightly technical slide. Uh, let me just remind you that when I talked about spin glasses, I said that there were two kinds of measurements that people do. Measurements of correlation functions, which you just let the system evolve. You don't do anything to it, but you take pictures of the microscopic configurations of them and you correlate them in time. These are correlation function measurements. And other kinds of measurements where you perturb your system at different moments and you see how they're system response to these perturbations. So the perturbation measurement will give you information about this chi, which is like a susceptibility, a response function that will depend on two times, the time where you do the perturbation and the time at which you measure the response. The correlation function, sorry, uh, also depends on two times, the two times at which you compare your configurations. In equilibrium, these two quantities are proportional. And they are proportional with a proportionality constant that makes temperature appear. Basically, in equilibrium, if I plot chi against C, the pair of chi and C measured at the same couple of times, and I do this plot for different couples of times, I will get a straight line, which is the violet straight line, which is indicated in this other plot here, with a slope which is minus one over the temperature of the bath. This is the content of what is called the fluctuation dissipation theorem. And it's a theorem that applies to any system in equilibrium. In equilibrium, be it microcanonical, canonical, in equilibrium, independently of the ensemble. Now, this 
cases here, I know they are out of equilibrium. I know they are out of equilibrium in particular because the correlation functions are not stationary and the response functions, the susceptibility, are not stationary either. If they were in equilibrium, they should have been um, stationary, but they are not. They depend on the two times at which I do my measurements. But what happens if I compare the response to the correlation in the same way as I told you would give the violet straight line in equilibrium? What happens? So what happens is that the construction follows the straight line for a while, a while measured in terms of the values of the correlation functions. When the correlation functions don't detach so much from one, which with this normalization would mean equal times. So for short time differences, correlations not so different from one, the construction follows the straight line, but then it departs from it. So it departs from it, telling me once again, that the system is out of equilibrium. But <clears throat> can I extract some useful information about the new slope that I get in this further decay of the correlation farther away from one or not. So within solvable models of spin glasses, this construction can be calculated analytically. And for certain models, you get a single slope departing from the temperature of the bath below some threshold value of the correlation function. And moreover, you can understand that this slope is indeed a temperature the inverse actually of a temperature. And you can prove that it behaves like a temperature. So basically what I'm saying is that this other slope here, I can interpret as an effective temperature that is telling me that the system is out of equilibrium, but this I knew it already, but it's telling me more. It's telling me more because it has connections to the landscape. So I can understand this temperature as being also arising from some microcanonical definition of temperature linked to how many minima maxima I do have in this rugged landscape as well. So it has a connection with an entropy, not the usual one, an extended one, but one which has a concrete definition, can be calculated and can be put in context, in context sorry, with this uh, effective temperature. It can also have, uh, it also does have uh, an intuitive meaning. So what do I mean by intuitive meaning? Just let me say it here. So it turns out that in situations in which you start from a very disordered initial condition, very high temperature, you put your system at, you know, your sample at infinite temperature in the lab and then you cool it down. It turns out that this effective temperature is higher than the temperature at which you have cooled down your system. So in a sense, this temperature remembers where your system is coming from. So it remembers the disordered initial condition where you started the system from. And on the contrary, if you start, <coughs> I'm sorry, your system from a crystalline configuration, perfectly ordered and you heat it, then you will see that this effective temperature is lower than the bath one. So the slope here, the construction will go in the opposite direction. It will bend above the straight line of violet color. So it's telling me that uh, you know, there is some memory of the initial conditions that is uh, contained in the value of this effective temperature. And this can be made much more um, quantitative than what I'm saying. I mean, it can be uh, pushed in different directions. I don't have time to do it. But basically what you have to keep in mind from these uh, arguments is that from the analytic solution actually of mean field spin glass models, which looked very unrealistic, this idea of there being effective temperatures are characterizing the out of equilibrium dynamics of these crazy systems arised. And it was then measured experimentally and it was observed experimentally. And then, you know, it was applied to different kinds of systems, uh, including these active Brownian particles. So for example, if I take the active Brownian particles for parameters such that the system has phase separated into a dense droplet and a dilute gas, what happens if I try to measure 
responses and correlation functions of particles which are within the dense region on one side and of particles which are in the dilute phase on the other side. I'm not supposed to get a single temperature because this system is explicitly out of equilibrium because of the energy injection. But from the evaluation of a fluctuation dissipation relations between responses and correlations, even out of equilibrium, the comparison between the two, what do I extract? Well, I extract that actually the dilute particles are at a higher temperature, effective temperature, than the dense ones. The ones which are in the dilute phase are at a higher effective temperature than the ones which are in the dense one. Okay, this can be used in different ways. Uh, I don't have time to, to discuss that. It can, maybe you heard about fluctuation theorems, which are very fashionable or were very fashionable now a little bit less in the um, context of mathematical physics and uh, statistical physics in general. So they are theorems that apply to out of equilibrium systems. So the effective temperatures have a, a role to play there. Um, they can be used to understand heat flows, ratchet effects, I don't know, many, many different um, situations uh, which arise uh, out of equilibrium and which are very interesting. So I will jump over the quantum thing because I don't have time to go through it. So let me just conclude. So what did I do in this talk? I basically exhibited three classes of out of equilibrium macroscopic situations slow relaxation in open quantum systems in contact with baths, like uh, the oil and water example, the spin glass problem. Uh, I also gave you an example of biophysics, which is this active matter systems where energy is uh, eaten from the surroundings to make work and uh, be able to translate. And a little bit about quenches in closed uh, quantum and can, could also be classical systems, integral problems. Um, I talked about some basic uh, physical issues like universality, phase diagrams out of equilibrium, the role played by topological defects, which also exist out of equilibrium. What do they do? Well, very briefly. But all these are areas where there are research going on. And then a little bit about thermodynamic concepts out of equilibrium. So told you about effective temperatures, this idea of comparing spontaneous and induced behavior of the system, spontaneous relaxation and induced responses, and use the departure from what's the equilibrium expectation observed out of equilibrium to extract a concept, a notion, which is the one of a temperature, but now out of equilibrium and uh, try to use it to understand the, you know, the microscopic uh, behavior of, of these problems. So of course, there's much more to be told and much more to be done and understood uh, on, these, on these fields. Uh, this is just like a kind of introduction to the problem. And uh, well, I want to thank you with, uh, uh, for your attention and for inviting me to, to give this talk. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks, Professor for the very nice presentation. Um, is there any question for the audience from YouTube and from the Zoom? So there was something in the chat, but I don't know if it's uh, from this part of the talk or from the other one. We cannot access the chat now. Oh, I see. I get there is a, there is a big question here. The sun. <laughs> <laughs> I can read. Uh, yes, please. Uh, okay. A question from Luis Carlos Latoski. He is finishing uh, a master oriented by Professor Jefferson at the University <laughs> of Rio Grande do Sul. Uh, we're actually working at self-induced disorder in 
in the voter module. Uh -huh. I'd like to make a question about one of the, your recent published papers, the one about nucle nucleation in the POTS model. Uh -huh. I'd like to know if the choice of the Kenshin temperature being close to the critical temperature is essential for the result you've obtained. I mean, if you would make a Kench, let's say to a zero temperature, uh, would it, we expect this in the same behavior? No, no, actually not. I mean, it's, it is essential because the um, region where, oh, maybe I can use one of my transparencies here to, to answer. Uh, let me see the analogy. The region where, you see, the region where there is nucleation in the POTS model is equivalent to the region between these two lines in this uh, phase diagram here on the left. I don't know if you see my pointer. Maybe you don't, no? Oh, what happened? Sorry, sorry, sorry. I lost my transfer. Here it is. So the, the region where you can have nucleation is between the binodal and the ESP nodal not below the SP nodal, because below the SP nodal, the metastable state of uh, the high temperature initial condition disappeared. And the system is no longer possible to be trapped in this metastable state. So for the POT model, uh, there is a region in temperature between <clears throat> the critical temperature of the POTS and the equivalent of this SP nodal line here, which would be a SP nodal temperature, where you could do have uh, nucleation. If you go below this TS of uh, the SP nodal, uh, the pot model just coarsens in a normal way with no nucleating phenomena. So basically the initial condition becomes unstable below TS while it was metastable in between TS and the critical temperature. So this is why in that paper we chose a temperature which was very close to the critical one uh, to keep the initial condition as being metastable and be able to see nucleation. <laughs> okay, very, very nice. Uh, another question is Leonardo Maia on YouTube asking, the presence of more than one effective temperature mm -hmm. could be related to some kind of multifractionality. Multifractality, he says? Yeah, multifractality, yeah. Uh, that's, uh, well, in the context of spin glasses, uh, since we know that this effective temperature that appears, uh, not the one equal to the temperature of the bath, but the other one, it's related to the geometric properties of the free energy landscape where the system is evolving. Uh, and we know that where this takes place is a complex uh, region of the free energy landscape and the entropy of this region of the free energy landscape uh, is related to the effective temperature, then something like that could be, some conclusion like that one can be reached. In particular, there was a paper not so long ago by um, the Roman group, Parisi and, and collaborators, where they talk about multifractality in the context of this region of the free energy landscape that we call the threshold many years ago. Uh, so there may be some connection to be done, uh, but I am not sure it's uh, you know well settled and uh, well understood, but there could be, yes, perhaps. Yeah, okay. Um, so another question is from Mateus. Uh, in the integrable case of non-equilibrium dynamics, in the thermodynamical limit, it appears to have uh, infinite parameters in the phase space. Is that correct? And also, this system have phase. If this system have phase transition, yeah. So yes, there could be phase transitions. There can be. They they are actually, and um, it depends on the problem, of course. But uh, in some problems, they are. And um, I guess that when he says infinite number of parameters, uh, he's referring to these gamma mu here. Uh, yes, indeed, there's an infinite number of parameters, as many as uh, you know, degrees of freedom you have in your problem. And the way to fix these parameters is with this requirement that I didn't um, explain, uh, which is that you know, when you do this quenching procedure, you 
choose an initial state. So in the initial states, sorry, in the initial state, there is only one, these constants of motion, these charges take given values, no? because in the quantum formalism, for instance, you sandwich your uh, states with uh, each of these i mu's and you get numbers. These numbers are conserved by the dynamics, by definition. Uh, now, you want to get these numbers also from the average of the i mu's taken with this measure here or with this density operator. So then you impose that these initial numbers be equal to the expectation values of the i mu's with this measure. So you do the trace of i mu square, i mu hat, sorry, times this row hat and, um, and you compute. So this gives you conditions on the gamma mu's that you fix in this way. So it's what you would do uh, for the usual Boltzmann case, just with the Hamiltonian and the energy. But here you have to do it for n uh, conditions. And in this way, you fix the gamma mu's and you see the gamma mu's know about the initial state. Because if you were taking another one, these numbers would be different. And then you would get different gamma mu's from these conditions. So the initial conditions of the dynamics are encoded in these gamma mu's in the same way as in the usual case, you know, the initial conditions determine the energy and then, okay, from it, the beta. So uh, it's the same way in which it happens, only that you have to do it for n quantities. So there are many problems in which uh, this program has been carried on. Uh, and the simplest ones are spin chains. So typically spin chains, the integrable and easy ones, can be mapped onto free fermions. So then you have the energies of those free fermions or the, the um, okay, you, you have the uh, jordan Wigner transformation, you have free fermions, so then you can compute everything. You can compute the dynamics and you can compute also the GGE and uh, it's the, um, uh, well, I have it here. And instead of saying with words, it's complicated. <laughs> With, uh... So is this operators here, um, these uh, numbers of uh, the um, fermions at the index K, uh, which are the conserved quantities, they don't interact once you have written the Hamiltonian in this way via jordan Bindman transformation, and these quantities are conserved, here they are. So they commute with the Hamiltonian and they are conserved. So then you can do everything and, and, and you can, compute the gammas for your initial conditions and so on and so forth. And this problem has a phase transition. So this problem has a phase transition at gamma equals one. Okay, yeah. So thank, thanks, Professor. Uh, we, we can interrupt the broadcast in YouTube. Mm -hmm. It's time to, uh, to go to the third part of the colloquium.